Are you starting with this slide or, or your slide? Or do you have this twice? Sorry, Beth, what was that? Are you starting off with this slide or the or, or your slide? Uh, this slide, it's the same. I included this slide in both. Oh, okay. Um, versions. Hi, everybody, welcome. Uh, we're still giving everyone a few more minutes. So thanks for being patient with us. And thanks for being here today. Okay, so I think we're in a good place for us to get started. Um, and then it seems like people are still coming in. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome. This is um, the Furnace First X Talk with um, Dr. Beth McManus. And we are super excited to have you all here. The topic for today is using a health equity lens to expand postpartum care for women in underserved communities. And my name is Alexandra Samaron Longorio. I am a research coordinator at the Center for Health Equity Research. And I'm also a co-lead in the Furnace First campaign as part of the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative at SHARE. And I'll be kind of facilitating the conversation today, but you will be hearing from uh, Dr. McManus mainly. And so a little bit of background, what are the Furnace First uh, X Talks? So these talks are intended to provide a space for uh, researchers who are conducting health equity research specifically to come and talk about the research from a storytelling format and in hopes for us to connect, uh, find collective learning and really understand, understand health equity and health equity research from a place of curiosity and recognize that, you know, 
there's a lot of realities that communities encounter when it comes to health and well being. And we want to understand how researchers, what is it that researchers are doing and how researchers connect to the health equity research they are conducting. Um, and so these have been going on by monthly, um, these conversations specifically with researchers. And this is a strategy that is part of the Furnace First campaign. Um, and overall, the Furnace First campaign is an initiative sponsored by the Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative, um, or SHRC, at Northern Arizona University. And as part of this campaign, what we want is to really create a bridge of communication between health equity researchers and communities who are directly impacted by inequity and also community leadership. Um, because, you know, there's a lot that researchers do and know about health equity, but also communities who experience inequity, they also have a lot of knowledge um, that we all need to find a place of collective exchange for that knowledge and and that information. And so this campaign intends to create that bridge of, of communication between research and community. So to continue our talk, we would like to set some Zoom community agreements. And um, we would really like to ask you to please uh, keep your camera on, but we know um, that a lot of us might be at home. And usually sometimes there's a lot that happens at home. Uh, and we understand if you don't wanna keep your camera on because maybe your kid is going crazy behind you or your dog is just going crazy. Um, and that's okay, but we, we strongly encourage you to keep the camera on so that um, Dr. McManus can see your face. We all can see each other's faces and it, uh, strengthens our engagement. Please stay muted throughout the conversation um, uh, so that we can all be able to understand what each other is saying. And then engage in the conversation. Uh, if you have questions or something to say, an idea, we welcome you to unmute yourself um, or even ask, uh, use the chat box to ask your question or um, tell us what you're thinking. And so now I'm going to transition or give the mic to uh, Dr. Buckmanis, but I just need to, uh, just give me one second. I'm gonna set up the screen for you all. Um, Okay, so here we go. So um, Dr. McManus, I give you the mic. Thank you, Alexandra. So um, thank you for all of you for coming. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Shirk for this opportunity to present to you today. I especially wanna thank Alexandra Carmenalita and Alexandra from SHRC for helping me put this presentation together and for their suggestions. Thank you to Esther, my collaboration partner who keeps pushing through this pandemic. Uh, she's actually working in clinic today. Um, a shout out to my co-chairs and fellow committee members from the College of Health and Human Services Health Equity Task Force who've taught me a lot about equity. And lastly, an apology to my students for not grading your papers quicker while I prepare for this presentation. So next slide, please. Uh, and, and the picture on the left is my maternal grandmother, my sister, who at this point in time uh, is the taller one and me. We grew up in Southern California. Uh, I, tried to be, I tried to be cognizant of the white privilege that I have had. Both of my grandmothers have had college degrees as well as both of my parents. My grandmother was a role model for me and I'm guessing for many other women. You see in, in the early 1950s, my grandfather died suddenly of an aneurysm. He, he died a day after finishing the plans for a new hospital that was going to be built. 
Uh, he was going to be the hospital administrator. Since my grandmother was intimately familiar with the plans and had taken over as an administrator of another hospital for my grandfather during World War II, the powers to be chose to make her the first administrator of the new hospital. So some of you may think, well, why is that such a big deal? Well, it was the 1950s and women rarely held administrative roles or worked outside of the home. In fact, my mother worked Work, my mother's work was raising uh, us kids, which was pretty typical job for women in the 60s and 70s. Growing up, even though I had a grandmother, um, first slide still, uh, even though I had a grandmother who was breaking barriers, I still, still re I, I soon realized that there were barriers for girls. Uh, to my mother's dismay, I was not exactly the, the Beth in Little Women. Instead, I was the kid who came home from school with mud crusted on my shoes, begged to wear pants to school, and was outside constantly playing basketball. Uh, yes, those of you who know me, obviously I was in denial that I was always the shortest kid in my class. So you can imagine my great disappointment when my brother got to play organized football uh, basketball and baseball, and of these sports, girls only had access to fast pitch softball called a league called Bobettes where I lived. There was no other sports for girls until junior high. Luckily, by the time I reached high school, Title IX had taken effect and there were many sport options for girls. However, cross country did not exist for girls until my sophomore or junior year of high school. Next slide, please. So we fast forward to college. I was fortunate to be able to run cross country and track in college. It was quite evident early on that the women athletes did not have the same benefits as the men. The women's basketball te team, which was highly ranked, played in an older and smaller gym than what the men played in. The men's teams had better coaches. I think it'd be fair to say that we considered ourselves lucky that we got to participate. While equity was not in our vocabulary, we dreamed of the days when there would be equality. When I was an undergraduate, I took a course that probably had the biggest impact on my life. It was a course on wellness, and I, I still have the book to this day, Fitness, A Lifetime Commitment. You could say it was a precursor to exercise physiology for the non-exercise science major. I loved that class. As a result, most of my life work has centered on wellness in some form or another. A, a few years after completing college, I learned that in addition to sports, the playing field was not level uh, in terms of women's health. In the 1980s and the 90s, researchers and others began pointing out that there was little funding or attention for research on women, especially related to heart disease. In fact, in the 1990s, the FDA had a policy prohibiting women in their childbearing years from participating in phase one drug trials and some phase two drug trials. The researchers uh, assumed that the results of the medical research conducted on men would apply to women. Those drugs tested mostly on men were prescribed by physicians to women, even though women are generally smaller and have a different metabolism. Around this time, researchers began to provide evidence that heart disease affected men and women differently. Men developed heart disease earlier in life than women, but women had worse outcomes after having a heart attack or surgery for coronary heart disease than the men did. In addition, women present differently when they're having a heart attack and they frequently are not treated as aggressively. These issues were even more prominent in women of racial and ethnic minority backgrounds. Next slide, please. After college, I worked for a year and then I went on to get my master's and PhD in physical education exercise science. I, I began to develop a stronger interest in women's health and looked at the effects of weight bearing exercise on bone density in older women. After a few years after completing my PhD, I became pregnant with my first child. We chose to see midwives for my care since I had developed a preference for nurse practitioners. I quickly became fascinated with birth and the care of the mother-to-be, but at the same time, dis disillusioned with the care that many individuals uh, who were pregnant received. Even though the new guidelines had been out for a couple of years, the physician who, was a, who I was required to see at the beginning of my care advised me not to have heart rate to exceed 140 min, 40 beats per minute when exercising, even though the new guidelines no longer recommended this. 
the rate for C-sections and episiotomies were high and individuals who were pregnant often reported uh, not receiving good care. Some women were harassed for breastfeeding in public. Due to my fascination and disillusionment, I later chose to return to school, yes, I'm a little crazy, and became a nurse midwife. Since that time, I have worked in suburban, rural, and college health settings. I've cared for women from a variety of races and ethnicities and saw the disparities in care firsthand. A few years ago, I returned to academia to help train new nurses and to conduct um, research. Next slide, please. Since the 1990s, gender disparities in cardiovascular disease have persisted. Women continue to have worse outcomes in healthcare treatment than men. The disparities for women from minority populations are even greater. The highest prevalence of cardiovascular disease in women are those in individuals who identify as black. Women from minority populations also tend to have worse cardiovascular health than women who identify as white. Enrollment of women in research trials continues to be low, especially among women who belong to racial and eth ethnic minority groups. Women from minority groups are less likely to receive the same treatment for cardiovascular disease than men and white women receive for cardiovascular disease. So at this point uh, in the chat, if you could, um, I, I'd like to ask you what factors put underserved pregnant individuals at risk for maternal mortality and morbidity. So in terms of maternal morbidity, we're talking about conditions that women have when they're pregnant and mortality is the death rate when people are pregnant. Um, so Lisa says lack of prenatal care. Yes, exactly. Lack of support. Definitely, because they don't have the support to get to the prenatal care. Low, low social economical groups, hypertension. Yeah, hypertension is a big problem. Diabetes is a big problem. And definitely lack of transportation is one. Um, more chance of type 2 diabetes, stress, poor ac ac access to nutrition. You guys are hitting them all limited to access to health services. Racism, ah, Amanda, good one. Practitioners don't consider concerns in the same way as the majority group. Yes, definitely, that in, invisibility. Slides, uh, the next slide, please. So cardiovascular disease is, also, is often a uh, individualized chronic disease requiring precision care. However, it's important to recognize that health disparities related to cardiovascular disease are, are connected to social and structural determinants of health, one of them being structural racism as a driver of health disparities. This uh, image by the American Heart Association helps us to understand cardiovascular disease from an institutionalized place. Structuralized racism has been defined as normalization and legitimization of an array of dynamics, uh, historical, cultural, institutional, and interpersonal that really routinely disadvantage white, uh, that routinely advantage white people while producing calumative and chronic adverse outcomes for people of color. As you can see uh, in the image throughout history, there have been laws and events that have limited the social, economic, and financial advancements of, of people who are Black. Historical events such as the Indian removal of 1830, the Manifest Destiny of 1845, and the Dawes Act of 1887, all of which aided in the expansion of the, across the United States, uh, resulted in the displacement and dis mistreatment of the Native American and Hispanic peoples. All of these historical events affect social and structural determinants of health to this day. The World Health Organization defines health determinants as those conditions in which people are born, grow, work, live, age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of daily life. As a result of those discriminatory laws and federal practices, marginalized groups continue to be adversely affected in many of the health determinants. Many do not have access to quality housing, 
education, employment, healthcare, and safe neighborhoods without environmental hazards. They also experience food deserts, inequitable justice system, racism, and discrimination. The results in the dis disabilities in social and structural determinants of health are related to poor outcome, poor cardiovascular outcomes and health, other health outcomes. Next slide, please. Most pregnancies have good outcomes. However, like everything else, there are risks associated with pregnancy. If an individual who becomes pregnant has some pre-existing conditions, the risks are higher. Some individuals may have or develop conditions that may put them at risk for cardiovascular disease later in life. Others may develop conditions that affect their health long-term or, 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 or in rare instances cause death. As we'll learn, people of color are more at risk for those outcomes. The United States maternal mortality ratio or, or the death rate last, rank, last, uh, ranks last among industrial countries. Hemorrhage is the most common cause of death during pregnancy and heart conditions and mental health conditions are the most common causes of death in the postpartum period. Women who are black are three times more likely to die and women who are Native American are twice as likely to die from a pregnancy-related condition than their white counterparts. Many, if not of the disparities for cardiovascular health also apply to maternal health, especially since many of the maternal deaths are due to heart conditions. There are few additional, there are few additional ones that, that merit pointing out. Women who are black are more likely to have a C-section than women who are white. Individuals who have C-sections are three times more likely to die or incur severe complications than the individual who has a vaginal delivery. Individuals with Medicaid have a much more difficult time accessing healthcare. Medicare coverage goes only through 60 days postpartum if the recipient is not eligible for subsequent coverage. 12 states chose not to expand Medicaid through as part of the Affordable Care Act. And many of those states are in the South where 50% of the individuals who are black live. This adversely affects marginalized groups and perpetuates racial inequality, which is consistent with structural racism. Among those lines is the lack of paid uh, family leave. Mothers-to-be cannot afford to take time off prior to birth, leaving them exhausted and at greater risk for a bad outcome. They cannot spend time at home taking care of their babies and establishing breastfeeding and bonding with their baby. After having their babies, many individuals from marginalized groups report that their complaints and concerns during prenatal and postpartum care are discounted and they feel discriminated against, the, against by the providers and the healthcare system. Poor treatment can result in poor outcomes and long-term trauma to the new mama, the infant, and the entire family. Uh, so uh, the, another question is, uh, what information do you know about maternal morbidity and mortality rate in Arizona? So again, mortality is the death rate and morbidity is the condition of the illness. So what do you know about these in our state? I stumped everybody. That's a good question. Thank you, Sam. Well, uh, let's see, Karen knows a fair bit. Hi, Karen. Uh, Native May Americans have a high rate. You're exactly right. Uh, high rates for uh, BIPOC people, yes. Morbidity and mortality rates vary according to race. Yes, that's right, Sean. Well, unfortunately, you guys are right. Our numbers are not much better in Arizona. Part of the problem is a lack of access to care. There are two counties in Arizona that do not have any OB providers, Greenlee and La Paz, which are both located in the southeast corner of Arizona. Two counties have low access to maternity care, Graham and Cochise, also in the southeast corner of Arizona. 
These are referred to as maternity care deserts, which commonly have higher rates of poverty than, than counties uh, with access to maternal health care. In addition, there are multiple counties in which up to 43% of women do not have insurance. Here in Coconino, up to 17% of women do not have insurance. In Arizona, women who are undocumented are not eligible for prenatal care insurance and only their delivery care is covered. Many of these women go without prenatal care, putting them at risk for undetected conditions such as high blood pressure and gestational diabetes. There has been more education about, so timing of death uh, in, during the pregnancy, there's been more education about this lately, but most deaths do not occur during the actual pregnancy. Over 80% of the deaths occur during the postpartum period. However, in our healthcare system and culture, there's not much new, there's not much care for the new mama. Uh, most insurance policies only pay for one postpartum visit, which is usually at six weeks. While most individuals are interested in talking about the impending birth, it is important for the provider to address the postpartum period, especially for those who are at risk for cardiovascular disease later in life. However, I believe the biggest takeaway is that most of these deaths are preventable. If you see the, the rates down at the bottom, our healthcare system is failing women, especially those from racial and ethnic populations. A big, a big factor contributing to this is the lack of continuity of care. Next slide, please. Part of that continuity of care includes the transition from the prenatal care to labor and delivery to the postpartum period. As we have seen, the postpartum period is, is not without risk. During this period, the new mamas can develop preeclampsia, heart conditions, postpartum depression and anxiety, breastfeeding issues, concerns about the baby and a poor coping ability. This is an important time for them to, to monitor and address these issues. In addition to preventing immediate subsequent pregnancy and identify risk for cardiovascular disease later in life. Most importantly, postpartum care should be individualized and be an ongoing process. It is important to consider a new mama's culture and traditions regarding the postpartum period and the baby. Midwives also need to recognize barriers that may prevent a new mama from coming to be seen for the postpartum care. Next slide, please. Despite reading a lot during my first pregnancy, I felt unprepared for the postpartum period. No one told me about the exhaustion and no one told me I'd be lucky if I get to take a three minute shower and well, I, I'm kind of known for my long showers, although I'm really trying to take shorter showers now to save water. No one told me that breastfeeding would not come naturally. And then I realized I would not be seen by my midwife until six weeks after the birth of my child. As, as a midwife, I became even more aware of the poor job we did in preparing mothers to be for the postpartum period. Most of the prenatal appointments are spent addressing the, the prenatal period. It could be challenging to get the moms to be, to plan for the postpartum period. Sadly, we were lucky if we asked if the mama to be was planning to breastfeed and if the baby provider had been selected. By the time the six week appointment rolls around, many new mamas are just getting their feet underneath them and they don't feel the need to be seen and are no shows for this crucial appointment. However, not all new mamas are feeling confident by the six week appointment mark. Many would love to be seen, but they have barriers that prevent them from being seen. Individuals who are under 20 or over 30, who are uninsured or have public insurance, have unstable housing and or transportation challenges, or don't speak the same language as their provider are most likely not to show up for this postpartum visit. Next slide, please. So I joined the faculty at NAU in the fall of 2019. My husband and I moved here shortly before the fall semester started. Since I've been working as, since I've been working as a clinician uh, for many years, since my last academic foray, I was eager to meet people and collaborate on some research. In hindsight, I probably should have done some speed meeting to develop more collaborations given that COVID reared its big ugly head soon after my arrival in Flagstaff. 
However, in the fall of 2019, I was able to meet the midwives who practice at North Country Health um, Healthcare. They indicated that many of their patients do not come for postpartum care. Many of the patients have pre-existing conditions or develop cardiovascular disease risk factors during pregnancy. And 54% of the patients identify as Latinx or Native Americans, which puts them at more risk for cardiovascular disease later in life. North Country Healthcare is the only maternity care practice in Flagstaff that accepts AHCCS health insurance, the public insurance, and they also offer a sliding scale for the uninsured. We applied for the collaborative partnership through SHRC and were granted funding in spring 2020 to revise North Country's healthcare postpartum program. However, COVID hit after our first meeting and we put the collaboration on hold until this past uh, late spring, early summer. Esther Ellsworth Bowers, a midwife at North Country, and I revised the plan with an emphasis on rural and underserved women for ongoing postpartum care at North Country Healthcare that will include access to blood pressure machines for women who need ongoing monitoring and scheduling of postpartum visits based on the individual needs and risk of the women. It is hoped that in the long term, the new postpartum program will improve postpartum follow-up and reduce cardiovascular disease risk by reducing the postpartum no-show rate and increase cardiovascular disease screening and ongoing follow-up. This evidence-based program will be adapted to the needs of the patients, providers, and staff. All medical staff will receive education and training regarding the new postpartum care recommendations. Education materials, including blood pressure monitoring and the importance of postpartum care will be developed for the patients. Next slide, please. So Esther and I started this work in August of 2021. Esther is working on developing the new postpartum protocols. The protocols will include assessments for the risk of cardiovascular disease later in life. It is hoped that patients who are more at risk can be identified and transition to primary care after the postpartum period for further monitoring and preventive care. She's had discussions with the department manager and the OB clinical manager. Um, regarding the number of postpartum visits, um, which they have approved. The next step will be to discuss the proposed protocols with the providers and the staff. The protocols include discussing the postpartum period at the prenatal visits and provide a handout regarding warning signs, things to expect during the, uh, including the warning signs and things to expect during the postpartum period and to encourage the patient after her, her 36 week appointment to schedule an appointment uh, for the first or second week of the anticipated postpartum period. An appointment for six to eight weeks is normally scheduled after being discharged from the hospital after delivery. If there is a billable diagnosis, public insurance will cover the first or second week postpartum visit in addition to the six to eight week visit. For patients who have private insurance, the first appointment will be billed as a postpartum appointment and then the six to eight week appointment will be billed as a, a well woman's appointment. Esther plans to work with the administrators and the OB family practice residency doctors to develop a plan to transition new mamas from the postpartum care to primary care six to weeks, to eight weeks after delivery. Esther and I have, have also met with a, a certified nurse midwife who is Navajo. We wanted to learn about the maternal traditions of the women who are Navajo and how to best broach the postpartum period uh, with these patients during the prenatal period. We also hope to meet with a midwife or a healthcare provider who is hoping in the near future to learn about their maternal traditions. Next slide, please. So some patients have private insurance that will not cover an at-home blood pressure machine while some patients do, have, uh, do not have any insurance. Some of these patients do not have extra resources to purchase an at-home blood pressure machine. So blood pressure machines are needed for patients who are at moderate to high risk for preeclampsia, high blood pressure, or cardiovascular disease during the prenatal care. In addition, there are patients who develop conditions late in pregnancy or during labor or the postpartum period and need to have their blood pressure monitored at home. There are about one to two patients per month who do not have resources for these machines and their insurance does not cover it. It has been a challenge to secure blood pressure machines for these patients and they often go without. 
So I went to visit the medical supply organization that North Country Healthcare uses. In my first brief visit, the representative recommended using a STAT order during, uh, for the blood pressure machine from the clinic if the blood pressure machine was needed during the prenatal period. Esther trialed the STAT order and the patient did not qualify for coverage, um, although the patient had a history of a bad outcome. So I paid another visit to the medical, or medical supply organization and they recommended a cover sheet with specific information on it. I developed that cover sheet for North Country, which Esther will test soon in the, in the next few weeks. Um, I, will, I will again visit the medical supply organization and try to figure out how to order from the hospital if the patient has delivered and needs a blood pressure machine due to elevated blood pressure or some other symptoms. Esther and I have also just developed a relationship with the American Heart Association. They are looking for a grant to help pay for the blood pressure machines. And as a result of our communication with American Heart Association, the entire North Country Health Care Organization has joined the American Heart Association's target program, which helps healthcare organizations to improve blood pressure control rates through evidence-based quality improvement programs. This will not only help all the patients who are seen at North Country, but hopefully it will help monitor former maternal patients who are at risk for cardiovascular disease later in life. There's also a foundation that's associated with North Country. And this foundation has a, a, something called the Angel, Angel Fund. Patients or, or providers can make a request to have the Angel, the Angel Fund uh, be used to pay for particular medical expenses. The administrators of the Angel Fund have agreed to order blood pressure machines for patients who need them, but they're in, if their insurance does not cover them and the patients cannot afford them. Uh, in the meantime, we'll continue to look for funding to help pay for the blood pressure machines. Uh, next slide, please. Healthcare is a business and money is needed to help pay salaries and purchase equipment, provide for buildings where patients can be seen and more. Unfortunately, insurers do not always pay for multiple postpartum visits. Most private insurers will only pay for one postpartum visit uh, unless there's a specific diagnosis. Medicaid expires after 60 or eight, eight weeks. Sometime, and sometimes the Indian Health Services coverage does not extend to North Country. Some patients who start at Sacred Peaks transfer to North Country instead of going to Tuba City for delivery. I met with several midwifery colleagues about how to bill for prenatal and postpartum nurse visits for blood pressure checks and for postpartum visits other than the six to eight, six to eight week visit. Esther met with the billers at North Country to see what can be billed. We determined that there is a way to bill for nurse visits and can bill for multiple postpartum visits for those with public insurance. Private insurance usually is a global billing and which means that all the prenatal care is included in that prenatal billing, but if there is a medical need for an appointment, it, it can be billed separately. Uh, next slide, please. Over the next few months, we hope to complete the tasks already mentioned, plus develop a form to submit to um, the Angel Fund. They order the blood pressure machines from Amazon, so we'll need to determine if they can be delivered to someone where the rural address or PO box. As soon as the protocols are approved, we will begin to develop education materials for staff provi providers and the patients. We will also develop procedures for sending patient records to their primary care providers. Before and during and after the protocols are implemented, we will meet with all medical staff members as needed and regarding the blood pressure monitoring and scheduling of a postpartum visits. Feedback will be obtained regarding any proposed changes and the implemented changes. North Country Healthcare caters to many individuals from underserved communities. Many of these communities are exposed to social and structural determinants of health, which put them at risk for cardiovascular disease later in life. We hope by making these small changes will be the change needed to help improve cardiovascular care of women that have been neglected for so many years. Some of this care will require a better understanding of the postpartum period and how to help reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And on a personal note, I hope that the daughters born to these patients face less health inequities in the healthcare arena. And if they 
so choose to participate, I hope that they have fewer inequities on the basketball courts and on the running trails. Thank you. Um, lastly, this is just kind of a, a shout out. This is another study that I'm working on. We're looking at using Fitbits to monitor uh, women, individuals who are pregnant. We're trying to validate them. So if you know of anyone who's pregnant, who's 18 years or older, uh, please let them know about our study. We're looking for at least 30 people. You can be in the Flagstaff area. We'll probably even consider people who are outside the Flagstaff area. And they don't have to be active, but we would like some active people also. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McManus. And now we're gonna kind of open the conversation for any questions, any comments you all have, feel free to use the chat or just unmute yourself and um, yeah, so. Thank you for your presentation. Um, my name is Kelly and I'm a senior research coordinator with SHARE. And um, I just, I, I thought it was, all of your presentation was great. And I thought it was really cool that um, you physically went over to the, um, to the, oh gosh. Medical supply. Yeah, the supplies <laughs> place to like, okay. So we, we gave it a go based off your recommendation and turns out it didn't work the next phase and and um I guess I just really see the value and um and some frustration in like needing to um operate that way but you know thanks for your um all of that effort to do so and um I was wondering if you could remind me um I think I missed it but how um is it biometric information that um women um are eligible or like, how are you determining who um, gets the, um, the cuffs? And um, can you explain that again? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, so the, the visits to the medical supplies um, place, the first time I went was when uh, they had the door locked, and I think there was only one worker. She came to the door and opened it and asked me if I had a question, and she was she was obviously getting slammed with phone calls, so I didn't get much information. And then I went back the next time and I hit the jackpot because the um, the the, min, the person who runs that um, place, you know, uh, was actually there, and so they were uh, definitely willing to work with us. And they 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 actually called the Phoenix to find out information for me and gave me cards, so um, I know who to go back to. So. Um, uh, that was that that was very encouraging and and yeah it, it it's something that we don't do anymore especially during COVID um, sometimes you can't get in the door the second time I did get in the door so um, and I and and I got to see a different part of town which is good um, so the women who um, are eligible that that's a good question um, the insurance companies will only even consider it if you have a diagnosis of hypertension, it doesn't, it just straight hypertension. Um, so you sometimes have a, a, you know, gestational hypertension, they won't qualify for that. So any kind of hypertension is what they'll qualify for. And um, so women whose blood pressure is starting to increase, um, they would order a blood pressure cuff for them if they start seeing it going um, higher than, than, than the, the, the rights they want to see. Uh, one woman they wanted to get it to because she had a history of type, I think it was type two diabetes and she had had um, a fetal demise. And that was the one that they declined. And we were like, well, that was, that was like the one that was should have definitely um, should have qualified. So we're still working on that process, and um, we're gonna we're gonna try the cover sheet um, and see if it works. So it's usually people with some risk factors uh, where we want to be monitoring their blood pressure. Does that answer your question, Kelly? It does. So, but it sounds like the the one 
the risk factor that's like a sure thing is that if they have hypertension and then you're working on other respect related risk factors that would be a risk factor for hypertension. Um, right. I mean, the you might put down, you might put down some other diagnoses, like, you know, like if they have any other diagnosis, you would put that down, but the cover sheet they're they're requiring, um, let's see if I can pull it on my head. Uh, the diagnosis, um, they have to know like the circumference of their arm. Um, they have to know if they're going, some women, there's, there's patients that live at the bottom of the Grand Canyon, they helicopter out. Uh, get and then find a car and drive the hour and a half to their appointment. So some of them, you know, some of them, the, you know, the other question is, um, are they going to be in town? If so, let's try to get it to them right away. Um, they have to have chart notes, which anybody who is a clinician knowing that you have to have chart notes immediately after the patient leaves is not always possible because you have room full of other patients to see. Um, so you have to have certain informations for them to approve it. Yeah, I, it seems kind of silly. Why can't we get blood pressure cuffs for these people? I mean, if you go to Walgreens, it costs 60 bucks and the, the consequences can be the woman can have a stroke. Um, you can have a baby end up in the NICU and I've seen bills for the NICU that are upwards of 50,000 or more. And I, I don't know why they're not making the investment 60,000, 60 bucks. Dr. McManus, there's two questions in the chat. Um, Maggie Freshwaters um, asks, okay. what kind of education information will be provided for the women who receive the blood pressure cuffs? For example, how to use the equipment properly and how to read the numbers. Well, Maggie, that's a good question. So I'll let the cat out of the bag. She used her married name. That is Maggie McManus Freshwaters. Um, so yes, uh, education, that's a good, that's excellent information, Maggie. That's good suggestions. Um, uh, the education, you know, actually we haven't thought about that. Um, so we will have to develop education, specific education materials about the blood pressure. Uh, what values they will see, uh, what what values that they need to call the midwife for if they see them itching up too high, um, and uh, and yes, we should include information on how to use that information properly. So, um, my daughter is much smarter than I am and wiser. So, thank you. The other question I see is from Nancy Wichek. I'm sorry if I messed up the last name. Um, any idea of how many BP monitors would be needed per year at North Country? Um, well, Esther has estimated it to be about two to three per month is what we think. And so that would be probably about 24 to 36 per year. So it's really not that many. And those are, those are only people who Insur the insurance does not cover the blood pressure cuffs. Um, so there are, there are more people who need blood pressure cuffs, but their insurance will cover it. Uh, Medicaid will cover it. Um, we know that um, Anthem Blue Cross will not cover it. So anybody who has Anthem Blue Cross and has a high deductible and doesn't have $60, which there are many people um, that applies to, those will, uh, they will need the blood pressure cuffs. Um, so, and, and um, people who do not qualify for Medicaid, um, usually people who are undocumented do not qualify for Medicaid. Um, and the only, they only, Medicaid only covers their delivery, which um, is something new to me. I have lived and worked in um, California and uh, Washington as a practitioner and uh, prenatal care was eligible for people who didn't qualify, uh, who, were, who were undocumented. Uh, the other question is from Dulce Jimenez and she's asking, 
I am curious about who the medical staff team consists of, any engagement of community health workers or community health representatives to help provide education on using the blood cuffs and understanding their readings, provide social support, connect to other resources or services they may need for them and their baby to be healthy as well and well. Uh, um, don't say that, that's, uh, that's an ex ex um, excellent question. So um, obviously the only time I've um, met with the, um, gone over to North Country was pre-COVID, um, but according to Esther, and I think there's somebody here from North Country and they can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, they have, um, obviously they have certified nurse midwives, they have OBGYN physicians, um, they have medical assistants, they do have nurses or RNs, and I believe they're hoping to increase the number of RNs that they have registered nurses. They do have community health workers, and in our original, we had, originally we had planned a, a more um, extensive uh, revision of the of postpartum, but with COVID, uh, the the midwives are just so overwhelmed. Um, a lot of them had kids, so they were at home uh, schooling their kids for the last year, and they're still, um, they've had a couple come and go uh, or leave, so they've been really, really busy. So, but another thing is we had discussed is using the community um, workers to go out into uh, to the homes and and work with with the women postpartum. That is an excellent way of of doing it, and that might be something that um, can be addressed later on. Um, um, can the, I add something, Beth? Sure. Uh, so I'm Karen Holder. I, I'm semi-retired, but I have worked in the OB clinic at North Country for a long time. But we have a Health Start program, and they're the community health workers that you referred to, Beth. Because of COVID, they are just now starting to be able to do home visits again. And, um, and they do see moms uh, between birth and uh, the six week checkup, but only by referral from one of the providers. And so one of the things that hopefully will be enhanced through the program that Beth and um, Esther are working on is more referrals to them so that they can get out there, educate the, par uh, the parents on not only how to use blood pressure cuffs, but uh, some of the educational materials on cardiovascular disease and signs and symptoms to be concerned about, those kinds of things. They can follow families up to two years after the birth and any time during the pregnancy, but with a referral only. Um, and I, I have been watching the Maternal Mortality Action Plan and um, I, I do actually have um, a doctoral student who sits on that committee. Um, and so she sends me a lot of the, the work that they're doing. Um. Okay, so we're really close to ending and thank you so much everybody for being a very engaging crowd and for being here with us. Um, you can see on the screen Dr. Uh, McManus's uh, email and then we would really, really love if you complete um, our evaluation survey, just so that we learn from you. Um, what did you think about this session? Uh, what can we improve? Um, we really care about um, the quality of these events. Um, and so please, if you can complete the evaluation survey. Um, Dr. McManus, thank you so much. I really loved the presentation and any, any last statements from you or from anyone in the audience, um, please. Uh, yeah, anything else anyone wants to add? <laughs> I see a lot of a lot of thank yous. Wonderful talk. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you.
Beth, would it be okay if you stay? Yeah. Thank you. Bye, Alicia. <laughs> There's 